privilege to make films for you. Cameron is more kick-ass than any guy I've ever met. I always felt like I had a sense of adventure. She was scared for her life. This isn't the first time that she had been through something like this. She's terribly talented. <laughs> I get to do what I love to do. If I don't appreciate that, I'm a total ass. Cameron Michelle Diaz's story began 200 miles south of Hollywood in San Diego, California on August 30th, 1972. Her mom, Billy, worked as an export agent and her dad, Emilio, as a foreman for a local oil company. Both my parents had a very strong work ethic. They worked really hard um, at their jobs and then when they came home, the home was really important to them. So my mom would work all day, come home and cook dinner every night, you know? Billy and Emilio doted on Cameron and her older sister, Shemaine. I was very close to my parents. And there wasn't anything that they didn't support us in or encourage us to do, so. As a family, we didn't have a lot of money. We couldn't go on vacation, so we would take a Volkswagen bus camping up north. So we spent a lot of time sort of fishing and um, hiking and, uh, and manual labor. <laughs> Before the girls started elementary school, the family moved to a working class neighborhood in Long Beach, California. The Diaz sisters weren't typical girly girls. Well, my dad wanted sons. <laughs> he wanted a boy. I was his last shot. So <laughs> uh, my sister and I, we grew up, both of us, as tomboys. We both played sports, scuffed up our knees, and tried to keep each other out of trouble as much as we tried to get each other in trouble. <laughs> you know what I mean? So. Every student at Hughes Junior High School knew Cameron Diaz, and I think it was because her biggest strength was her willing to be friends with anyone. She was very supportive of people, down to earth, very friendly, and people liked Cameron. Cameron's positive attitude made her a star in our high school drill team. We were at the Bonaventure Hotel, and we rode up and down the glass elevators for about Actually got sick. 28 Almost times. Got sick. Cameron was always quite distinctive. She wasn't going to be like everybody else, and so she was constantly pushing to see how she could do it a little bit differently or just stand out a little bit more. At a party one night in Hollywood, 16-year-old Cameron attracted a lot of attention. I was up here with a girlfriend, and there was a bunch of people that had come up to me and given me cards. Hey, you want to be a model? Huh? You know, just like this. I was just like, yeah, sure. And threw the card over my shoulder. had no interest. She was just radiating this kind of light, and I, I thought, yeah, this is a really beautiful young lady. So I went over to her and I just said, you know, who's your booker? Um, thinking that she was with a model agent and I would be able to uh, maybe bring her in for a job. I said, oh, I'm, I'm not a model. And he said, well, you should be. He goes, how old are you? And I was 16, and he was like, tell your parents to call me. And I was like, oh, what? he's the only one who said tell my parents to call me when I told him he was 16. A week later, I got a call. Hi, it's, uh, it's Cammy. My father wants to talk to you. So she put Emilio Diaz on the telephone, and he said, so what's all this about? And I said, look, if you like the idea that your daughter become a, a model, I'm pretty sure I could help her. Great. Dad was on board under one condition. I remember Emilio came up to my office with Cameron the following week. He looked at her, and he said, you know, if your grades suffer, I'm going to pull you out of this so fast and make your head swim. And Cameron promised that she would keep her grades up. With her parents' blessing, Dunas helped Cameron put together a portfolio. He sent me up to Elite Modeling Agency, and they signed me, and then I just started going out, you know, on castings as a model. In the summer of 1988, Cameron's agency booked the teenager on a trip overseas. In Japan, there's a great appetite for tall blonde women to be models because that's obviously the exact polar opposite to the Asian woman. So they'd go to Japan to make money. I lived there for three months with a girlfriend and I really always loved being out in the world. I always felt like I had a sense of adventure. Her parents trusted that she'd make the right choices and that she'd come home safely and wiser and onto a bigger thing for herself. The experience transformed the budding model. You go back and you're like, this isn't the real world. High school didn't mean the same thing to me because I knew that I wasn't going to use anything that I was getting from it. But my parents said, you have to graduate from high school if you're going to keep doing this. Cameron kept her promise, and in 1990, she earned her high school diploma. 
I wasn't interested in what they were teaching, but I did my work focused on keeping up my end of the bargain with my parents and then moving where I, I wanted to be, which was on my own, living in LA, um, you know, seeing what was going to happen. Sell it, baby, sell it. Oh, she did. You're so where's your whip? No whips for you. Not long after graduating high school, Cameron Diaz already had a successful career. She was the ultimate California girl and did uh, quite well in the catalog market. I met Cameron in the early 90s on a low budget <laughs> catalog shoot. The thing that I remember most about her is that she just had this beautiful energy. It was cold outside, it was windy, and she didn't complain like the other girls. <laughs> Why don't you get in the dress? The clients that Cameron worked for just adored her and would rebook her constantly. She was like the perfect model for Seventeen. She just had that all-American, beautiful girl look you could relate to. Cameron was the kind of girl that you just wanted to look like, you wanted to hang out with, you wanted to be friends with her. Cameron, make your hands a little bit looser. She was professional and that made her very successful. She was making probably up to 2,500 a day on catalog work and much more than that on advertising type jobs. Making a, a really nice living as a model afforded me, you know, to be able to live in Paris, uh, which was amazing. On a trip back to the West Coast, Diaz was visiting her modeling agent when she spotted a script for a movie called The Mask. I inquired about it and jokingly I said, yeah, sure, I'm ready for a feature film and um, she sent me in. <laughs> Cameron originally thought she was only going to be reading for one of the supporting characters, but I asked her to please read for the lead and she was more than willing. I think all of us um, at the agency at the time, we really encouraged Cameron to go out for this role. I knew she had the personality and the charisma to pull it off. They really wanted Anna Nicole Smith, but uh, Anna Nicole decided that she wanted to go and do Naked Gun 33 and a third. So the search began all over again. We had gone through the usual suspects, and I saw an 8x10 of Cameron Diaz. No one knew who she was. I just said, make sure that when this girl comes through for the very initial reading, I get to see her. She came walking into the office totally full of this energy and basically said, I have no idea what I'm doing here, but I'm here. Cameron Diaz was a natural. She charmed all of us. There was something special about Cameron and she had no acting chops. So I essentially was looking for someone like Cameron who had an acting background. Diaz returned to her day job. I went back to Paris. I got the phone call that the director really wanted me to come and, you know, uh, read again. So I packed all my stuff up in Paris, flew back to LA, and then I started going on callback after callback. The audition process started getting tougher. So I said, please, I don't know where this is going to go, Cameron but let me get you into dance lessons and let me get you into some acting lessons. She said, great. She never acted before and she was nervous, she was apprehensive, but she was willing to live in what we call uncertainty. She came in and said, this is me. And she was willing to let the people see who she was, ready to learn and ready to try anything. The moment I really knew uh, Cameron was it was the first time I put her and Jim in a room together. And it, there was sparks. It was, it was old-fashioned Hollywood uh, chemistry going on there. Chuck was so wonderful and just said, stick with me, stick with me. You're going to be my Tina Carlisle. The studio was not happy with the choice of an untrained actress in the lead role. I literally taped every scene in the film to present it to the studio finally and say, look, this is my leading lady. Two days before we started filming, he got them to say yes. <laughs> when I broke the news to Cameron that she did get the part, there was a moment, and then there was screaming. Then there was very loud screaming. Landing the role was only the first hurdle. The script we had written, obviously, for kind of a Jessica Rabbit type girl. Cameron's body was not necessarily the physique that they wanted for this cartoon-esque character. Cameron was asked through channels if she would get breast um, 
or, um, yes, put breasts in. And Cameron basically said, I'll push him up, I'll do anything you want. But no, 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 I stay who I am. I'm 21 years old. When it came to some of the final wardrobe tests, I was still making sure the studio was comfortable. And uh, we did help make her just a little bit more curvy for the part. And with great good humor, Cameron worked with us. And they pushed her up. <laughs> they did. I mean, the dresses were so tight. And she was thin that, you know, any sort of curves just went right under her neck. So it was perfect. Even with the right look, Diaz didn't feel confident. I think Cameron got frightened when she got the part. I really do. I think we all did. She was very nervous because it was the first time she was in a film, let alone a big studio feature. I think it's one of those things when you don't really realize what's at stake. Roy. I had done, you know, a handful of commercials before this, so I knew how to be on a set. I knew how to be in front of a camera, but I didn't know what I was doing. I was just kind of going off my gut. Uh, the next thing I know, I'm on the set making a movie, kind of going, is there any place that my parents will be able to see this movie? And they were like, uh, in the theaters, possibly? And I'm like, oh, I'm making a movie that's going to be in the theaters, right. You know, completely naive as to sort of what I had gotten sort of stepped into. All of a sudden, we heard a crack, and Cameron went down. So that immediately takes her out of the running. In the spring of 1994, Cameron Diaz made her way to Cannes to promote her debut film, The Mask. The 21-year-old was overwhelmed by the attention. It's really frightening. I mean, I did photo call this morning where 100 photographers show up and start screaming your name over and over and over again. By the end of it, you just want to say, what, what, what have I done? You know, who can I, where should I go? What should I do? So it's really sort of, it's nerve wracking, but it's, it's really, you know, it's exciting to come here. That summer, The Mask premiered in the U.S. and made Cameron an instant movie star. Gee, baby. came suddenly overnight, who's the blonde in the movie? Who is this girl? Who is this girl? She's just this insane smile. That was really it for her. Hi, how are you? Hi, Cameron. Hi. Nice to meet you. Well, I've, I've already seen the film. You have. It was great, and Thank you were you. great. Thank you. It was a major uh, breakthrough for her because the nature of the movie was so original. Cameron loved every second of it and she was just like a child about it. It was a lot more fun for her than modeling. I loved making movies so much that I just decided to keep going with it. New Line had fallen in love with Cameron Diaz watching the filming of The Mask, and they were ready to make her a deal for their next film, Mortal Kombat. She had no idea about martial arts, but hey, it was almost funny. She went, yeah, sure, why not? We brought Cameron in, and the trainer started going through the moves with her. And all of a sudden, we heard a crack. And Cameron went down. And she went, I think I hurt my wrist. And her wrist was broken. So that immediately takes her out of the running. The break turned out to be a lucky one. Cameron was getting a lot of offers for sort of your typical studio, big action movie. But she really wanted to focus on sort of more independent, smaller movies, character pieces. I had no experience as an actress other than working with Jim. I just said, okay, can I really do this? Instead of throwing myself out there in front of everybody, I thought taking a smaller part in a small film for me, working with great actors, was just the most logical thing to do. Later that year, Cameron filmed a low-budget dark comedy called The Last Supper, co-starring Bill Paxton and Courtney B. Vance. I play um, a girl named Jude, and Jude is sort of morally bankrupt. She's not quite sure where she, uh, she fits in. Being a part of an ensemble cast gave her confidence as an actress that she was effortless in that film. What are you doing, Lou? Nothing. Let's just drink and get this over with. No, I don't think so. The hard part was adjusting to her newfound fame. The drawbacks to my career, um, probably having to do interviews. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> drawbacks to my career would probably have to be having my credit card um, uh, denied 
And then somebody asking me for my autograph. <laughs> that happened once, yeah. But it wasn't my fault. <laughs> right afterwards, the girl goes, hey, everybody, this is a girl from the mask. Can I have your autograph? But hey, you know, I'm learning to live with it. A slew of indie roles like She's the One and Feeling Minnesota allowed Cameron to stretch her acting abilities even further. I think the independent route was a way for her to do roles that were not predictable. She was taking on different characters and kind of figuring out what she wanted to do. I was like, hey, this is great, let me explore this stuff. Filmmaking is just trying to figure out how to make something work. There's so many things happening at once, and that's a thrill for me, and, and it made me want to make more movies. With her newfound confidence, Cameron signed on to play opposite Julia Roberts in My Best Friend's Wedding. It was really a, a vehicle for, for Julia, who at the time was, you know, one of the biggest stars in, in the world. Cameron was not that interested in the beginning. I mean, she actually turned it down a couple of times, but PJ really wanted her. I uh, couldn't think of anybody who really could hold her own with Julia Roberts. But when Cameron walked in, I thought, wow, if this woman isn't a star, she's going to be one. During filming, one musical moment proved extra challenging. Oh my god, the karaoke scene for me was just terrifying. But I assumed she could sing because she sang in the mask. And she, I said, well, you've got a great voice. And she said, uh, you know, that wasn't me singing, really. And what is your voice like? And she said, it's terrible. It's like chalk on a blackboard. Cameron was very nervous. She said to me, so PJ, how, you know, how many people are on the set? And I said, oh, a few, a few, it's okay. You know, just let it out. You know, you're just going in there to be humiliated, knowing that you're just, you're going to hurt a few people on the way, you know? <laughs> there were 300 people on the set, and I had told them that Cameron Diaz was going to sing a song for them, and if they'd seen the mask, they knew what to expect. So Cameron was really set up. I start walking into the set and I'm shaking, I'm nervous, my palms are sweating. Dermot's kind of giving me a little heave-ho. And everybody's looking at me like they've never heard anything like it. I was so embarrassed, I started crying. <laughs> Don't know just what to do with myself. I'm so used to doing everything for you. The expression of, of horror on Dermot Mulroney's face is real, because nobody knew she was going to sound like that. It was just very mortifying. Complete strangers watching you sing, you know, as bad as you are, just not even trying to, to, to disguise it or hide it at all. Nobody else could have made that scene work, because I, I, it, it's such a humiliating sequence, and Cameron just made it fly. <laughs> It was a flawless performance, and it really was a big moment in her career. When we saw her on the screen across from Julia Roberts in My Best Friend's Wedding, that's when everybody was like, wait, how come I'm staring at her when I should be staring at the biggest woman in Hollywood? I said, Cameron, if you do this movie, you're going to be the biggest comedic actress out there. And she looked at me, she, she said, I don't want that. In 1997, Cameron Diaz was everywhere, thanks to her breakout role in My Best Friend's Wedding and her high-profile relationship with actor Matt Dillon. She fell for her first big Hollywood star, and she had no problem talking about it in the press. Matt has 100 girls following him. What do you do in that situation? What do I do in that situation? <laughs> I don't know what I would do. I'd probably hang up some sort of tripwire or something like that. Sit, wolf chaps. <laughs> Cameron's combination of humor and sex appeal made her extremely bankable. She was offered more than two million dollars to star alongside Ben Stiller in the comedy There's Something About Mary. She seemed very comfortable doing comedy and, and we needed somebody like that and uh, I, I actually remember it came down to her and Courtney Cox and I got a message that Courtney couldn't do it because she was on Friends at the time. And so that sort of just left Cameron. No offense to Courtney, but I think Cameron was the right 
was the right, you know, person for the role. Cameron was certainly in the Fowley brothers' vision of who Mary was, because she has obviously great comedic timing. I said, Cameron, if you do this movie, you're going to be the biggest comedic actress out there. And she looked at me, she, she said, I don't want that. And I said, whoa, 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 I mean, you won't, you won't be that big. It's really, really, really funny. They're brutal. It's like they, they come up with the most bizarre things. We had to meet with her a couple times, and I remember her concern was the hair gel scene, and probably for good reason. I was like, absolutely not. There's no way that I would ever, you know, think about that. If it didn't work, she's going to be walking around for the rest of her life like, hey, hey there's head, you know? And uh, <laughs> that was her fear. Her career might have been over right there. And as it went along and it revealed itself, I completely, I mean, I, I laughed. Literally, I mean, literally, I laughed until I fell on the ground. So <laughs> she just throws the whole vanity thing out the window, which you have to do to be funny. Any woman with semen in her hair that a man still thinks is hot and women want to be friends with, ladies and gentlemen, is a star. The directors didn't have to go far to cast the part of Cameron's sleazy suitor. When we told Cameron, she said, who's playing these roles? We said, Matt Dillon, and she says, uh, I'm going out with Matt Dillon. Farley Brothers realized that they had completely lucked out. They had these two people that were so comfortable with each other. They were always joking around with each other. Very lovey-dovey. Really? That's my all-time oh, favorite on, movie. Don't, uh, don't bust my chops. I really, <laughs> I really like that movie. No, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. I swear. I, I think that really? Harold and Maude is the greatest I'm love story of our time. Times. What was it like getting to work with your real-life love? It was great. It was nice. We walked to work together a couple of times. It was nice. <laughs> We get to hang out, spend more time together. I think it's sort of unexpected, you know, when you see, you know, actors and actresses that uh, are involved together, that work together. We came away from it going, you know, that could have been really ugly, but somehow it like, it wasn't bad at all. In fact, we really enjoyed it. Well, they were having a lot of fun on set, and and that kind of spread to everyone else. The outrageous comedy became one of the decade's biggest hits. Something about Mary took Cameron into a new realm in Hollywood. She was nominated for a Golden Globe in 1999 for Best Actress for this film, and she won the New York Film Critics' Choice Award and the MTV Movie Award. To get these kind of accolades so early in her career was a big deal for someone that young in Hollywood. Unfortunately, Cameron's relationship with Matt Dillon fizzled out. You started hearing rumors about Cameron was wanted to live in L.A. and Matt wanted to live in New York. With the distance, they just decided that it wasn't going to work. Neither one was going to move. I think that they both got really busy at that time, from going to seeing somebody that you work with every day um, to not, you know, it's kind of the nature of this business. Cameron was ready for something different when she got a call from director Spike Jones for being John Malkovich. Spike originally wanted her for the role that Catherine Keener played, which we felt like was more obvious. And when Cameron read that script, she just fell in love with Lottie. She really fought for that role and went after it. To play the part, Diaz underwent a major physical transformation. Our challenge with this movie was to make Cameron look dowdy, mousy. She had very little makeup on. She had brown contact lenses. I added individual fake eyebrows to give her these really bushy, unflattering eyebrows. And then there was this wig that got crazier and crazier as the shoot went on. But she loved, you know, being a character. I decided that I'm a transsexual. I think the first time everybody kind of looked at Cameron and being John Malkovich, everybody was like, wait, who is that? Is Cameron in the film? Yeah, yeah I was in the film. Well, who are you, who did you play? I, I, um, I, I played uh, 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 your wife. Oh, that was you? Yeah, that was you. Oh, so good to see it's you It's great again. to see you. Yeah, I really liked your no, work. No, no, you were fantastic. You were great. Everyone was like, wow, she's in it to win it. Look at her. She's going to do this character. She got a SAG and a Golden Globe nomination. The only thing that surprised me, actually, is that she didn't give an Oscar nom. Did you ever expect so much recognition for it? No, I didn't. And I know you didn't either. I know. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was kind of going, uh, is anybody going to get this film and see it? it? Yeah. Being John Malkovich showed you that this woman was in Hollywood and she was here to stay. By 1999, 26-year-old Cameron Diaz was on her way to becoming a bona fide movie star. There's a moment in New York that I remember where I knew it was different. You know, people were following her everywhere. So when she began dating actor Jared Leto from My So-Called Life, the actress kept it under the radar. This was the first relationship that Cameron decided to keep close to her heart. She felt like she was being exposed, you know, the more and more famous she got. When interviews rolled around when she was with Jared, 
she would constantly, you know, say, I don't, I don't want to talk about that. And I have one more question, though, Mike. They're going to kill me at work if I don't ask you. Any truth to these rumors that we're hearing? Thank you. In the spring of 1999, actress-producer Drew Barrymore wanted to cast Cameron in the all-star action feature, Charlie's Angels. But Diaz needed convincing. Her agents, her manager said, you, can, you know, Cameron won't do this. It's not the kind of thing she looks for in a movie. We basically needed Drew to sell us on what this movie could be. We were sort of looking to maybe do a more serious type of thing. None of us were really for it. It just wasn't obvious to us. Drew saw a vision that it had to be Cameron. Ultimately, Drew sold all of us on, on why that made sense. Cameron signed on and threw herself into the role of Natalie. We started training with Cameron three months before the movie started, and he had a strict regime of fight lessons. It was a sort of Chinese, orientated, kung fu type flavor to the movie. She can punch and kick and run and surf. She's a genuine ass kicker. You feel like you're watching Jackie Chan with blonde hair and a big toothy grin. It's hysterical because she always wants to throw herself in the line of fire and risk injury and you see the people from the studio saying, no, 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 let's get the stunt double. She's like, no way, I'm going to do that. And she'd go flying across the stage and do her thing. I love going to work every day knowing that we're going to get to drive fast, hit hard and, um, you know, kind of come up with a way to thrill the, the audience. Cameron's next movie took her from action to animation, voicing the character of Princess Fiona in Shrek. The creative team really saw in Cameron this very strong and confident woman. But remember, Fiona is both a princess and an ogre, and Cameron is both an amazing, beautiful, heartfelt woman, and also more kick-ass than any guy I've ever met before. And so she embodies both sides of that. <laughs> Shall we? I've always felt that acting in animation is actually the very hardest form of acting there is because any actor suddenly loses half their tools. They no longer have their physical body. It all has to come from uh, the vocal performance and from something that's internalized. It's sort of like what comes first, the chicken or the egg. You don't go into a room and everybody sits around and huh, plays off of each other. We just saw storyboards that are literally like freehand quick sketches of a donkey, an ogre, and a princess. So you're not thinking Mike or, you know, Eddie or John. Oh, a little unorthodox, I'll admit, but thy deed is great and thine heart is pure. I am eternally in your debt. It was crazy just seeing my gestures, recognizing something that was so familiar, but looking at somebody who doesn't resemble me physically. <laughs> Diaz continued to expand her range over the next few years, appearing with superstar actors Tom Cruise in the film Vanilla Sky and Leonardo DiCaprio in The Gangs of New York. She's terribly talented and multidimensional and able to represent a great many personas. She can be one of the great comedians. She's more physical than any woman I've ever known, and she can be decidedly dramatic. And those are skill sets that are often in opposition to one another, and she's found a way to embody all of them, and that's very rare. Cameron's career was moving forward, but in April 2003, her relationship with Jared Leto ended after four years together. And I think when celebrities go through any sort of change in their life, people just love to know why. And I think it becomes magnified when everyone wants to be involved in it. Living it out publicly, I think, is, you know, a whole other layer of challenges. I do think that that was just a relationship taking its course. Neither last or they don't. And that relationship was longer than some marriages. A few months later, Diaz kept things casual when she met pop star Justin Timberlake at the 2003 Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Awards. She presented him with the Burp Award, which she had won before. And that gives you basically the gist of the beginning of the chemistry between Justin and Cameron. That night, we ended up going to a nightclub and we danced all night. They just fed off of each other, you know? It was just this instant sort of attraction that was unstoppable. And they started going out. I'm just a huge fan of his. I'm completely in, in awe of him. The pair quickly became Hollywood's it couple. 
He is the golden boy and she's the golden girl. And they both are so mega in their own field. And the media's desire to follow her every move was difficult at times. With um, the internet and with all sorts of magazines and all sorts of photographers, there was more coverage. They couldn't escape it as easily. Everything they did, it would just always be documented. That was hard because their relationship became so magnified. This was his first big relationship post Britney Spears. This was her first big rock star boyfriend. There was an age difference between them. So at first people were kind of like, "What? what's going on there? Saying, you know, why is she picking another young guy? Why isn't she getting into a serious relationship? Cameron felt very violated and betrayed on a lot of levels. 2003 was a big year for Cameron Diaz. The 30-year-old had a new boyfriend, pop star Justin Timberlake. And with her paycheck for the Charlie's Angels sequel, the actress moved to the top of the Hollywood A-list. Full Throttle took Cameron Diaz into a very elite club. Of all the female lead actresses, only Julia Roberts was making $20 million. The men had been earning it, why not them? Their movies are hugely successful. And what that really correlates to is that she's worth $20 million a movie. Because studios don't pay it if you're not worth it. But with success came new problems. According to court documents, Cameron's manager was approached by a photographer who claimed he had been offered money to sell old photos of Diaz taken when she was much younger. In the beginning of her career, Cameron made some decisions that young girls are faced with. You're going to be asked to take your top off, and you're going to be asked to do things to exploit yourself. The photographer, John Rutter, maintained that Diaz signed a model release, allowing him to shop the photos to other sources. But Diaz claimed she never signed anything, and that Rutter stole the photos from her. He was eventually arrested and charged with attempted grand theft, attempted extortion, forgery, and perjury. Her testimony is as we expected. She's denying that she signed a model release and she's talking about what happened. The more interesting subject will be when she talks about what happened in 2003 when Mr. Rutter offered her the right of first refusal to these photographs. Cameron felt very violated and betrayed on a lot of levels. It was somebody coming back, being malicious with something that she had intended for a whole other purpose. Rudder pled not guilty, but was later convicted and sentenced to three years and eight months in jail for forgery, perjury, and attempted grand theft. Cameron got to protect herself and her livelihood um, and her choices to participate in what she wants to participate in and how she wants to versus someone making that choice for her. He got what he deserved, but certainly she and no one involved felt good about the whole thing. He put us into a situation where we had no choice. Cameron stayed focused. In 2004, the actress put her clout behind a passion project for the small screen. Trippin' was an eco-friendly reality series that we co-created and sold to MTV. And it came out of both of our loves for the environment. If I could say anything to anybody, just do your part. You know what I mean? Just try the littlest thing. She really does think about, care about, love the world that we're in. It's one of the places that she is constantly directing her philanthropy towards. Diaz also called on her boyfriend to help out. We figured that that would be a way to get people to watch the show. So when Justin came on Trippin', he was an unbelievable addition. and They just laughed and had such a great time together. They also continued to be a prime target for the paparazzi. On November 6, 2004, the high-profile couple was caught off guard by a barrage of flashbulbs at the Chateau Marmont Hotel in Hollywood. Photographers allegedly jumped out from behind the bushes, and Cameron and Justin had just had enough. It's difficult for people to imagine what it actually feels like to be bombarded. The cameraman says that he was attacked, there was a scuffle, that they took their camera. Cameron says that she was scared for her life and took the camera from the photographer to turn it into police to be able to actually track this person that was hounding her. For Cameron and Justin both, it was just an automatic reaction. You react to protect yourself, and neither of them were expecting that, and it definitely threw them both off. One week later, photographers Saul Lazo and Jose Gonzalez filed suit against Cameron and Justin for assault and battery, claiming they were attacked while taking pictures. The couple countersued, alleging slander, emotional distress, and negligence. The parties later reached an undisclosed settlement. 
I think it forced her to think through the like relationship she could and would have with, with the paparazzi. We respect that they're doing a job, but we wish the laws would change. There's nothing that I empathize with more than a young actress today having to deal with a paparazzi. They're virtually stocked 24-7. If I was fearing being in this position, then I would be a really miserable person. <laughs> being able to manage that is, for me, it's essential. In June of 2005, Cameron found herself in another legal battle, this time with the National Enquirer. They ran a photo of her hugging a producer from the MTV show Trippin, saying that she was cheating on Justin Timberlake. The actress filed a defamation suit against the Enquirer in Los Angeles and London. According to the LA Times, Diaz was later awarded substantial damages from the magazine's publisher. She had the money and the power and the time, and she fought it. Still, the media continued to track the couple's every move. In early 2007, press reports surfaced that Cameron and Justin were drifting apart after almost four years together. Cameron and Justin's relationship was really scrutinized in the public eye. They released a public statement in January saying that they had split, but none of us know exactly what really happened. It's difficult when you're already having your own personal loss and grief. A breakup is not easy, and it's amplified by the fact that other people are talking about it, and sometimes other people that you don't know are saying really nasty things um, about you or about him. That's what's tough for celebrities, because if they have something happen, they don't get to go through it like we do. Everybody has to go through it with them. It's just unfair. In early 2007, Cameron Diaz and longtime boyfriend Justin Timberlake released a joint statement saying their romance was over. They had a great relationship when it was working for them, and when they went their separate ways, they were always very generous with each other. Although they were no longer an item, Cameron and JT shared the red carpet at the London premiere of Shrek the Third. In this one, you've got your ex on the cast list. Uh, how difficult does that make things? Um, he's right there. I mean, there's no blows being thrown, is there? <laughs> it's only difficult when people ask about it because then you go, why are they asking about it? You could feel that she was a little bit pressured, a little bit more guarded. She wasn't exactly herself. Clearly, she had just gone through a huge public breakup, but she was still respectful. There's clearly a mutual respect between these people, and it's kind of impressive to watch in Hollywood. The following year, Cameron started filming My Sister's Keeper, a heartbreaking drama about a young girl dying of cancer. It's very, very heavy, and, and Cameron played a no-nonsense mother who was gonna do anything and everything she can to save her daughter. She nailed it. I enjoyed making this movie with these girls, though. It was so much fun. For as much as its, you know, focus is on a child dying, um, it's also about a child who's alive. I learned so much about life and death on this movie. Taking care of yourself and taking care of the people that you love is the most important thing, period. That lesson became all too real for Cameron during production. She was in New York and her sister called and said they're bringing her dad to the hospital. Cameron got on a plane right away and went home. A few days later, on April 15, 2008, Cameron's father Emilio died after a bout with pneumonia. It was very sad and so sudden and unexpected. Emilio's death was devastating. Definitely losing her dad was her most difficult time in her life. Yeah, definitely. It's tough. They were very close. For the first time, we saw a more vulnerable side to Cameron. I was really fortunate to be with a group of people who were very supportive, but also, you know, I have a really strong group of friends, and they all were going through it, too. They were all having that experience with me. Work on My Sister's Keeper shut down temporarily, but Cameron insisted on finishing the project. I can't even imagine how hard that would be to still come into work and do her job and, and do it, you know, so great. She was committed to making sure that she did her best. That was a particularly, you know, challenging that it was, you know, on a level that I don't think I've ever experienced, but that's what I, I knew I had to do, and um, there was no any other option, and I was finishing the job, and my dad would have wanted that. Cameron's strong work ethic and talent brought her huge financial rewards. In the summer of 2008, she became the highest paid actress in Hollywood, according to Forbes magazine. She's the architect of her own success, and she's had a couple $20 million paydays, and that's incredible. 
When Cameron was honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in June 2009, she had two important people to thank. I dedicate this star to the eternal love that my mom and dad shared. It was what has given me the strength and courage to live this extraordinary life. And it is what powers the light that burns inside of me bright enough for me to be honored today with this star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Getting the star was really a nice sort of validating moment. She was very proud and honored. I'm grateful for being in this position. I get to do what I love to do. And in return, I have people who like me. And if I don't appreciate that, I'm a total ass. <laughs> you know what I mean? Audiences especially love Cameron as Princess Fiona. So when the fourth and final installment of the Shrek franchise geared up, Diaz signed on immediately. There's a whole new Fiona nobody's ever seen before. And, uh, and there's just a whole other side of Cameron that's uh, going to come with it. I think that her work in this final chapter is without a question the best. Fiona! Oh, I'm so happy I found you! Maybe you missed orientation, but for future reference, personal space is very important to me. Trek is one of the major parts of my career that I'm very proud of. It kills me that this is the end, it really does. And as it goes, as I get closer to the end of the carpet, it really, it's setting in and, and uh, it's, it's sad, it really is. Cameron wasn't out of work for long. In September 2009, she jumped into an action comedy starring opposite Tom Cruise in Night and Day. Tom Cruise is amazing. Working with him was a thrill. I loved every second of it. It's such a unique, fun movie, you know? It's hard to even put it in a category. In a movie like that, it's not up to a computer. It's like those two people doing these really difficult stunts that are literally dangerous and make it look effortless, which is definitely something she'd never done before. The chemistry between these two is as good as it gets. We had a lot of fun and hopefully make people laugh while they're watching it. Cameron's next move was reuniting with ex-boyfriend Justin Timberlake for the film Bad Teacher. Cameron is a genius businesswoman, and she knew exactly what she was doing when she took this role with Justin Timberlake. I know to the outside eye, it was kind of a really big deal, you know, two friends that had once dated working together again. They're really, really funny together. I think that their shared history does a really great thing for the movie. Justin and I are great friends. We're having a blast, and he's so funny, so talented. The part is perfect for him. He's perfect for the part. And we're having, we're just laughing our, you know, laughing our asses off. It's hilarious. Fans hoping Cameron and Justin would hook up again were disappointed. But in the spring of 2010, press reports linked Cameron to Yankees player Alex Rodriguez. Cameron is a girl that likes to have a good time. She dates A-Rods, she dates models, she dates younger guys. The press will continue to release stories in making her either the player or the cougar or the poor girl. I think that she's just trying to find the right one. And has she found it? Obviously not yet. Will she find it? I think she will. In both her work and private life, Cameron Diaz is ready for the next great challenge. She's not scared to put herself at risk. That's one of many reasons that it's kept her so relevant as an actress over such a long period of time. The story's not over yet for her, so I think that she goes with chapter by chapter. Um, you know, it might land on the white picket fence and the, and the veil, it might land on you know, something totally different. Where do I want to be in 10 years? I want to be doing something that makes me happy. Do I know what that'll be? I have no idea. I'll know when I get there. My philosophy is sort of like, don't worry about the future, just take care of where you're at right now. And, and um, that's what, what I've been doing. I think, do you guys think that that's um, my philosophy? Or am I just blurting out? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs>